Welcome to uh, this uh, Golden Jubilee lecture series, which I'm sure you'll all agree is turning out to be a wonderful series of lectures. Uh, I don't have any uh, further role to perform. Uh, both the speaker, Sudhir Kakkar, and the chair, Ashish Nandi, are too well known for me to introduce them. Ashish will do that honor. Uh, so, Ashish, could I ask you to start begin chairing? I hope you will not consider it uh, uh, improper that I will sit and talk. I'm a Bengali, All, always more <laughs> comfortable sitting. Uh, it is customary in this part of the world to say that somebody doesn't need an introduction and they speak on the subject for 20 minutes. Uh, I will avoid that temptation too. But I will tell you this, that as our times recede and newer generations will come in, they will recognize Sudhir Kakkar as arguably the most interesting creative psychoanalyst India has produced over the last 100 years. India psychoanalysis has a very long history in India, starting from the first decade of the 20th century. And in these 105 odd years, he is probably the best we have produced. But Indian society has increasingly become, despite a different kind of tradition, that it had lived with earlier, very uncomfortable with human subjectivities. Uh, I have been trying to recover the expression entry interceptiveness from the 1930s, which Henry Murray used to use. Anti interception interception is the opposite of perception. And I want to resurrect that word because I do notice in India, in the, particularly in the modern sector, a very quickly growing hostility to anything which take, looks within. Our social theories, our political theories, our theories of culture, even culture, are heavily oriented to developing principles and laws that will transcend the inner self of human beings. And we are more comfortable with that because that is seen as a liberation from the unpredictability, chaos, and ambiguity of human affairs. So ultimately, they will get an idea of a new kind of social sciences where you can dispense with human subjectivities altogether. That is the job of history too, not only social sciences that historical records, the dependence on archives, is also a way of avoiding, avoiding human subjectivities, human feelings, human pain and suffering, and its direct experience. It is here that the need for depth psychoanalysis comes in. I use the word depth psychoanalysis because I don't want to be de uh, depend on this word psychoanalysis. It's the name of a particular school of psychology. I, I have a special sympathy for it, but that's a different matter. Uh, I would like to open up the situation. In fact, in Sudhi's recent work, from what I hear yesterday, he's, what he said day, day for yesterday, I guess also is taking a larger concept of deaf psychology, where it is a different concept of uh, psychoanalysis he has began to work with. And I look forward to his future works with great anticipation. It is in this context that what he has to say, we have to listen. And I hope as our the time of our generation recedes, there was some mention to, of that in Garanath's presentation and Sudhi's presentation too, two days ago. Uh, perhaps people will look at some of this work as pioneering efforts which needed a different kind of intellectual placement. With these words, I approved 
that Sudhi doesn't need an introduction, <laughs> I guess. And Sudhi. Uh, thank you very much, Ashish. Uh, it's been a long time that uh, I've been not at the center, but we wrote one of our first papers in, I think that's 40 years ago together mm -hmm. on authority in Indian society. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there will not be too much of subjectivity in this talk. It is in the book that it is, but not in this one. Uh, maybe, maybe because of the same reasons uh, which, uh, which you gave that maybe it won't be that much appreciated here, but it wouldn't have also fit in. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the complementarity of civilizations Rabindranath Tagore revisited. So on 20th September 1878, together with his brother Satendranath, Robi sailed for England. He was to stay there for about 16 months. As an intrepid explorer of his many dualities, male and female, <clears throat> inside and outside, India, West, human divine, the works of man and inspiration of nature, Roby's English sojourn marked the beginning of a lifelong exploration of another duality in his psyche, India, West. <clears throat> It also signaled the end of his boyhood. In England, he says, I absorbed within myself the fusion of East and West. In my own heart, I discovered the meaning of my name. Roby, name for the sun which rises in the East and West alike. This is the final sentence of his memoir on his boyhood days. After the first three months spent in the shelter of his brother's family, who had rented a house in Brighton, Rabindranath went to London to begin his law studies. In his first autobiographical writing, he remembers a cruel London wrapped in a mantle of cold loneliness. Knowing no one who lived nearby and unfamiliar with the topography of the city, he would sit for days at the window of his scantily furnished room, gazing at the gray, wintry outside world. He describes the view from the window in words that could apply equally to his inner world. I quote him, there was a frown on its countenance. The sky was turbid, lacking luster, like a dead man's eye. Everything seemed turned in upon itself, shunned by the rest of the world. Yet little of this gloom <clears throat> is evident in the 13 letters he wrote back home at the time, many of them to his sister-in-law and muse, Kadambri, and published in the family periodical Bharati. In these letters, at the beginning of his stay, especially the winter months in London, there are indeed complaints about the weather and, quote, arrested mobility that cloaks everything, the sun that has diminished to a mere hearsay, and where in this land of darkness all my intellect seems to be wasting away. I cannot write so much so that even composing a letter seems to be beyond me. Only after coming to this country have I fully realized the worth of our mornings and evenings and our moonlit nights. By the end of his stay, however, the wintry gloom has given way to summary exuberance. In one of his last letters from Torquay, a town in Devonshire, he rhapsodizes over its scenic beauty, riverside, fields, he has never seen a place as beautiful as this where everything seems to smile. That his first autobiography, Jeevan Smriti and Paschatya Brahman, Letters from a Sojourner in Europe, remember his England sojourn differently is not surprising. The memory of a past period of life is not the result of a deliberate weighing of its highs and lows to reach a considered opinion. The selection of remembered events is also dictated by the memoirist's present affective state. In case of Jeevan Smriti, a 50-year-old Rabindranath emerging from a long period of mourning. London was certainly another immersion in loneliness, a condition that haunted Rabindranath during much of his life. 
Yet what the letters written at the time focus on is not what London denied the 17-year-old Roby, but what it granted him, the exhilaration of emerging from a familial cocoon into the wonders of a wider world, and above all, the gratification of being admired and found desirable by the opposite sex, thus consolidating a masculine identity that had seemed vulnerable in his latency early teen years. Marked by sharp observations of English life, full of wit and verve, the travelogue constituted by these letters is a fine piece of writing and remains an exceptionally percipient comparison of Indian and Western mores. What makes the travelogue even more remarkable is that it is penned by a 17-year-old, and for me, it is a more conclusive evidence of Rabindranath's genius than his early poems. Rabindranath himself was reluctant to publish these letters in the form of a book, which besides its literary value, also has the distinction of being the first Bengali book written in the colloquial language. He deplores precisely what lends the letters their verve, his youthful audacity, unmindful of any political correctness. His reluctance had perhaps also to do with his concern about his legacy. In the 1936 preface to the book, he writes that he is pleased to discover an underlying respect covering the wild profusion of disrespect to which his youthful self was prone. This is because I wholeheartedly despise the art of skillful and caustic derision. The capacity to love is God's best gift to mankind. I have never accepted the enticement offered by literature's scandal bongers. If nothing else, this is a fact about me that I would like to leave behind. Rabindranath was impatient with Roby's inclination to bravado. He was also dismissive of 17-year-old Roby's belief shared by many other youth that he was unique, wherein, quote, one has to say, I'm not like others. There's nothing anywhere that is fit for me to admire. I was then too young to realize that this is a sign of poor intellect and proof of foolish immaturity. In Roby's very first letter to his sister-in-law, Kadambri, we see an instance of what Rabindranath finds galling in his younger self. Landing in Brindisi in Italy, and stepping on European soil for the first time, Roby writes to her, you are aware of my imaginative nature. I had thought a marvelous sight would open up in front of my eyes as soon as I reach Europe. This must remain in my fantasies and can never be expressed in words. But I have seen since childhood that reality and imagination rarely match. I'm unable due to a flaw in my nature to fully experience many things. Before arriving in a new country, I imagine its newness in such a way that once I am there, it does not seem new anymore. Before seeing any grand spectacle, I imagine it to be so grand that in reality, it does not seem grand anymore. That Europe did not seem so novel to me made everyone speechless. But very soon, the authentic face of a wide-eyed youth emerges from the put-on mask of an all-knowing adult. On the train journey from Brindisi to Paris, Roby enthuses over the beautiful landscape like a poet's dream with its marvelous vineyards, mountains, rivers, lakes, cottages, tiny villages. Quote, it was as if you were reading poetry all the way. By the end of his stay, and especially after living for a few months as a boarder with Dr. Scott and his family, whose two young daughters promptly fell in love with him, a much more confident Roby is voicing unabashed admiration for aspects of Western culture which he would dearly want his countrymen to possess. The lack of servility in the servants, the respect for talent, and above all, certain features of family life and the high place of women in social life. From the passion and the length of his diatribes on the shortcomings of the Indian family, it is apparent that the West has become his ally in voicing some of his own discontents while growing up in the extended Tagore family. <clears throat> I quote him here, we do not give the name of servitude to slavery within the family, but we can at, at most gild it with a name and transform the iron fetters of discipline into those of gold, but cannot erase its restrictions. The harmful effects persist. 
I had once thought that Hindus were by nature simple and spontaneous, without any unnatural restrictive laws. But I am ashamed to say that any more. Hindus without unnatural laws just peep into their families. Just look at the rigidity between brother and sister, mother and father, men and women. It is even forbidden for one to talk too much or even laugh in front of one's elders. How terrible. If you, cannot, if you cannot talk freely to those with whom you spend 24 hours of the day, cannot laugh heartily if in their presence you have to rein your tongue in, place the weight on your happy countenance and wear a mask of reverence the livelong day, where then do you get for your, go for your relaxation? English homes have a feeling of cheerful relaxation. Parents, brothers and sisters, wives and sons gather around the fireplace and cheer it up with their happy talk, laughter and singing. After a hard days of work, one returns home to a sense of joy and familiarity. In India, in one room, the father-in-law, along with his clutch of elderly friends, sits drawing on the hookah and blames today's generation and its unholy behavior for the impending onset of divine recrimi recrimination. In another room sits the bride of the house, her veil drawn over her face, silently listening to her mother-in-law ladling up to her her daily dose of blame. In another room, her husband, along with his young friends, gossip maliciously. No one in England could imagine such a scenario. Our freedom of speech is with other people. In our families, we have to make strangers our own because our own are strangers to us. And in his praise of middle-class English women who play an active part in Western social life, we hear echoes of his frustrations around the confinement of women in the Andar Mahal of the Tagore Mansion in Calcutta. <clears throat> Quote again, these English women are not confined to the house. They converse with friends and at meetings when superior matters are discussed. They listen and may voice their own opinions. In the presence of people, a very happy and pleased expression is presented. Although she herself may not be a witty person, she enjoys a good joke, is generous with her praise if there is something she likes, and laughs heartily if she hears something amusing. It is not ideal behavior for women here to keep their lips sealed or to be overcome with shyness. A bit of reticence is not unpleasing to the eye. One may even see some poetic sweetness in it. But to deal with shyness the livelong day is painful indeed. <clears throat> if one is rewarded with an answer to one's question after two or three hours of perseverance, one can bear it once. But if one is brought to the brink of exhaustion each day in trying to get her to say a few words, it would then be difficult to survive. If you cannot share a joke with me without inhibition, I would be forced to disassociate myself from you and look for other company. The mantras chanted at the wedding ceremony will not magically give rise to love. Marriage by itself does not lead to love. If no love exists between my wife and I, and furthermore, if my wife cannot keep me entertained with lively conversation, will I not look for sources of amusement elsewhere, leaving my mute lady companion behind? Alarmed at Ruby's radical questioning of family and social values, and coupled with the fact that he was not making any headway in his law studies, Debinder Nath, his father, decreed that Ruby return on the same ship that was bringing his brother's family back to India. Rabindranath never lost his attraction for the West and what it gave him. A quickening of the mind in the company of other searching and alive minds who appreciated what he had to offer. The West never became his world, yet he remained forever grateful for the gift of acceptance and love he had received from it. In October 1913, he writes, I think, to his best friend, C.F. Andrews, in India, the range of our lives is narrow and discontinuous. That is the reason why our minds are beset with provincialism. And from London in July 1920, when I'm in the West, I feel more strongly than ever, I'm received in a living world of the mind. I miss here my sky and light and leisure, but I'm in touch with those who feel and express their need of me and whom I can offer myself. Our span of life is short and opportunity rare, so let us sow our seeds of thought where the soil claims them, where the harvest will ripen. As with the influential art historian Ananda Kumaraswamy and Mahatma Gandhi, 
It was the long and essential exposure to the West that enabled Rabindranath to make seminal contributions to the dialogue of civilizations. <clears throat> Rabindranath believed that the East-West encounter initiated by colonialism had so far been confined to the surface. In spite of its terrible violence and inequities, he professed to discern at the heart of this encounter the coming together of the ideas of West and India. Quote from him, my India is an idea and not a geographical expression. So it's the seeds that would germinate and mature in a great future union. His observance on India's encounter with the West, its consequences and its ideal outcome, for me remain unsurpassed in depth of insight. In his reflection on this encounter, Rabindranath was incisive on the disquiets afflicting both Indian and Western civilizations, disquiets which have become raging discontents in our own time. At the outset, let me first say that I am in substantial agreement with Rabindranath in positing an Indian civilization that has features which distinguish it from Western civilization. The main river in Indian culture, Tagore says, has flowed in four streams, the Vedic, the Puranic, the Buddhist, and the Jain. And then I quote him, it has its source in the heights of the Indian consciousness. But a river belonging to a country is not fed by its own waters alone. The Mohammedan, for example, has repeatedly come into India from outside, laden with his own stores of knowledge and feeling and his wonderful religious democracy, bringing freshet after freshet to swell the current. To our music, our architecture, our pictorial art, our literature, the Mohammedans have made their permanent and precious contributions. Those who have studied the lives and writings of our medieval saints and all the great religious movements that sprang up in the time of the Mohammedan rule know how deep is our debt to this foreign current that has so intimately mingled with our life. Then there are other currents, the Sikh, the Zoroastrian, curiously he omits Christianity, but also Chinese, Japanese, and Tibetan, for India did not remain isolated. Quote, side by side with them must finally be placed the Western culture, for only then shall we be able to assimilate this last contribution to our common stock. A river flowing within banks is truly our own, and it can contain its due tributaries but our relations with the flood can only prove disastrous. <clears throat> Rabindranath believe, believes, as I do, in the existence of an overarching Indian identity, in spite of many surface differences, which have been perhaps magnified by the discipline of social anthropology, that by its very nature is attuned to look at individual trees rather than espying the pattern of the forest. Rabindranath, of course, writes of this much more eloquently than I ever could. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll quote him again. The bringing about an intellectual unity in India is, I'm told, difficult to the verge of impossibility, owing to the fact that India has so many different languages. Such a statement is as unreasonable as to say that man, because he has a diversity of limbs, should find it impossible to real realize life's unity and that only an earthworm composed of a tail and nothing else could truly know that it had a body. He then goes on to compare India with Europe, which has a common civilization with an intellectual unity which is not based on uniformity. What is the defining feature of Indian civilization according to Tagore, whose loss is responsible for much of its contemporary disquiet? And I use the word contemporary deliberately for both Tagore's and our times, since the situation, if it has changed in the last 100 years, has done so only for the worse. The defining feature of Indian civilization, according to Tagore, which we are in the process of losing, is sympathy. Sympathy, as I understand it, is a feeling of kinship that extends to beyond what is our kin. A sense of we that extends beyond kinship. And this feeling of kinship is not limited to human beings, but extends to the natural world. Here, Tagore and Gandhi are in complete agreement. Brotherhood, as Gandhi writes, is just now a distant aspiration. 
To me, it is a test of true spirituality. All our prayers and observances are empty nothings, so long as we do not feel a live kinship with all life. For Rabindranath, in contrast to the West, Indian civilization sought to establish a relation with the world, with nature, as with also other living beings, not through the cultivation of power, but the fostering of sympathy. Uh, quote, when we know this world as alien to us, then its mechanical aspect takes prominence in our mind. And then we set up our machines and our methods to deal with it and make as much profit as our knowledge of its mechanism allows us to do so. This view of things does not play us false. This aspect of truth cannot be ignored. It has to be known and mastered. Europe has done so and reaped a rich harvest. For us, the highest purpose of this world is not merely living in it, knowing in it, and making use of it, but realizing our own selves in it through expansion of our sympathy. Not alienating ourselves from it and dominating it, but comprehending and uniting within ourselves in union, perfect union. In a letter to C.F. Andrews, Rabindranath articulates the ideas of India and the West through an, what is called an origin myth. From the beginnings of their history, the Western races have had to deal with nature as their antagonist. This fact has emphasized in their mind the dualistic aspect of truth, the eternal conflict between good and evil. Thus, West has kept up the spirit of fight in the heart of their civilization. They seek victory and cultivate power. The environment in which the Aryan immigrants found themselves in India was that of the forest. The forest, unlike the desert or rock or sea, is living. It gives shelter and nourishment to life. In such a surrounding, the ancient forest dwellers of India realized the spirit of harmony within the universe and emphasized in their mind the monistic aspect of truth. They sought the realization of their soul through the union with all. The spirit of fight and the spirit of harmony both have their importance in the scheme of things. For making a musical instrument, the obduracy of the materials has to be forced to yield to the purpose of the instrument maker. But the music itself is a revelation of beauty. It is not an outcome of fight. It springs from an inner realization of harmony. The musical instrument and music both have their utmost importance for humanity. The civilization that conquers for man and the civilization that realizes for him the fundamental unity in the depth of existence are complementary to each other. When they join hands, human nature finds its balance and its pursuits through their rugged paths attain their ultimate meaning in an idea of perfection. The ideas of the two civilization, when articulated through history, have picked up dross, and it is now through the distortion and perversions of their core ideas that the civilizations encounter each other. If the caste idea and the suf suffering of the excluded is an Indian distortion, then the perversion of the Western idea of a conquest of nature with its marvelous training of intellect is the passion for wealth and power. This passion has not only science as its ally, but also such forces as nation worship and idealization of organized selfishness. Nationalism for Rabindranath was collective selfishness, collective narcissism, deeply inimical to the idea of sympathy. Rabindranath is prophetic when he talks of the passion for wealth. The whole of the human world throughout its length and breadth has felt the gravitational pull of a giant planet of greed with concentric rings of innumerable satellites causing in our society a marked deviation from the moral orbit. A person, whether in the West or East, who has unreservedly embraced the idea of the West, together with its cult of power and idolatry of money, has, as he says, in a great measure reverted to his primitive barbarism, a barbarism whose path is lit by the lurid light of intellect. For barbarism is the simplicity of a superficial life. It may be bewildering in its surface adornments and complexities, but it lacks the ideal to impart to it the depth of moral responsibility. The future combination of the ideas of West and India could not come to fruition as long as the relationship between the two remained that of victor and vanquished, the giver and receiver. 
a realization of the complementarity of the two ideas required that Indians first became aware of their heritage, of the spirit or mind of India. And I quote him, once upon a time we were in possession of such a thing as our own mind in India. It was living, it thought, it felt, it expressed itself. The whole acceptance of modern Western education has suppressed this mind. It has been treated like a wooden library sh shelf to be loaded with volumes of second-hand information. And then he says, in consequence, it has lost its own color and character and has borrowed polish from the carpenter's shop. We have bought our spectacles at the expense of our eyesight. <clears throat> and further, if we were to take it for granted what some people maintain, that Western culture is the only source of light for our mind, then it would be like depending for daybreak upon some star, which is the sun of a far distant sphere. The star may give us light, but not the day. It may give us direction in our voyage of exploration, but it can never open the full view of truth before our eyes. In fact, we can never use this cold starlight for stirring the sap in our branches and giving color and bloom to our life. Language is an important part of what stirs the sap, gives color and bloom to our lives. Tagore's argument for the mother tongue as the medium of a child's instruction remains as incisive today as it was then <clears throat> and it needs to be widely disseminated when the demand for primary level schooling in English is being raised by par parents in many parts of India. I quote him here <clears throat> from his uh, Jeevan Smriti. It was because we were taught in our own language that our minds quickened. Learning should as far as possible follow the process of eating. When the taste begins from the first bite, the stomach is awakened to its function before it is loaded, so that its digestive juices get full play. Nothing like this happens, however, when a Bengali boy is taught in English. The first bite bids fair to wrench loose both rows of teeth, like an earthquake in the mouth. And by the time he discovers that the morsel is not of the genus stone, but a digestible bonbon, half his allotted span of life is over. While one is choking and spluttering over the spelling and grammar, the inside remains starved. And when at length the taste comes through, the appetite has vanished. If the whole mind is not functioning from the beginning, its full powers remain undeveloped to the end. While all around was the cry for English teaching, my third brother was brave enough, was brave enough to keep us to our Bengali course. To him in heaven, my grateful reverence. As a poet, Rabindranath is alive to the danger of what is known as operational thinking, that is verbal expressions lacking associational links with feelings, symbols, and memories, if the early education has been in an alien language. One's mother tongue, the language of one's childhood, is intimately linked with emotionally colored sensory motor experiences, and however grammatically correct and rich the vocabulary of its user, the alien language will suffer from an emotional poverty that is generally, generally fatal to the enterprise of poetry. For Rabindranath then, without a revival of the idea of India, of an Indianness or Indian identity in modern parlance, India, and quote here, will allow her priceless inheritance to crumble into dust and trying to replace it clumsily with feeble imitations of the West, make herself superfluous, cheap, and ludicrous. Such a fate may not be looked at with equanimity. In a globalized world that links not only entertainment and capital flows, but also ideas, the bankruptcy of the East will also have an impact on the Western mind, make it poorer. To adapt Rabindranath's words, if the great light of culture becomes extinct in the East, the horizon in the West will mourn in darkness. Rabindranath was not at a defensive and regressive repudiation of Western culture. Quote again, let me say that I have no distrust of any culture because of its foreign character. On the contrary, I believe that the shock of such extraneous forces is necessary for the vitality of our intellectual nature. The European culture has come to us not only with its knowledge, but with its velocity. Then again, let us admit that modern science is Europe's great gift to humanity for all time to come. 
we in India must claim it from our hands and gratefully accept it to be saved from the curse of futility by lagging behind. We shall fail to reap the harvest of the present age if we delay. What Rabindranath objected to was the disproportional space Western ideas and worldview occupied in the modern Indian mind and thus killed or hampered the opportunity to create a new combination of truths. It is this which makes me urge that all elements in our own culture have to be strengthened, not to resist the Western culture, but truly accept and assimilate it, to use it for our sustenance, not as our burden, to get mastery over this culture and not to live on its outskirts as the hewers of texts and drawers of book learning. Unlike Gandhi, Rabindranath welcomed modern science and Western forms of knowledge. He admired the fullness of intellectual vigor in the West that is working towards the solution of problems of life. What he bemoans is that the mental vitality of modern forms of knowledge are not balanced by the Indian idea of the cultivation of sympathy. Sympathy then, as I understand, is the highest manifestation of the human soul. It is a continuum of loving connectedness to nature, art, visions of philosophy or science, living creatures, and of course, to other human beings. For some, it is in the moments of connectedness with the world, its sights, sounds, smells, the radiance of its days and the darkness of its nights, the sap of its trees and plants and the joys and sufferings of its living beings, when they sense and surrender to the spontaneity of sympathy. For others, sympathy is sensed in a feeling of deep connectedness in presence of great art, in the solemnity of sacred spaces, or even glimpsed in the aftermath of the sexual embrace when the bodies have separated and are lying together side by side, but are not yet two in their response. It is in such moments that we sense sympathy as a hidden power in ourselves that is not self-centered and is a source of a higher self. These are moments of quiet exaltation that come from the flow of connectedness, from communion, to be sharply differentiated from the gratifying boost given by the heightened narcissistic feelings that come from, the understand, from, that come from understanding the world. Personally, I fully subscribe to Tagore's view that all poetry, philosophy, science, literature, art, religion, society, and politics serve or must serve to widen the range of our kinship, our sympathy, the principle of the soul. Initiated in our love for those who nurtured us when we were children and our own love for our children, friends, lovers as we get older, it is only the wider and wider manifestations of sympathy that are the true measure of human progress. The soul is insignificant as long as it is imprisoned within an individual self. It reveals its significance and its joy only in connectedness. The more vigorous our individuality, the less the need to encase the individual self in an armor of self-centeredness and more the capacity to make it permeable and thus participate in the play of the soul. To me, the question of the to me, the question of the fate of the soul after death, central for our religions, is not especially interesting. If we do not free the soul from its prison of individual self, guarded by waters of self-centeredness while alive, I doubt whether there is hope of its freedom, of its salvation after death. To adapt Robert Frost's observation on love, the earth is the only place for the soul. I don't know where it is likely to get better. How would cultivation of sympathy, the defining idea of Indian civilization, work out in practice? Let me take a few examples. Modern psychology, Western in its orientation, has made great advances in uncovering the mysteries of the human mind, the complexities of human psyche. The truth it has arrived at, valuable as they are, are, however, partial truths. They largely look at a human being from two angles. The first is that the person is a body, a brain-mind entity in psychological terms, and thus seek to understand the psyche through psychologies that derive from biology. A person is part of his bodily and social orders. What I would like to add, a dimension that I find largely missing from West-inspired psychology, is that a person is not only a part of his bodily and social orders, 
but also of her cosmic order. What I'm saying is that if we want to progress further to understanding human mind and behavior, then besides the soma, the body, and the police, the social order, we need, we need to take into account and focus on another partial truth, the cosmos. Cosmos, as I visualize it, has two aspects. One subtle and the other, well, earthy. The subtle aspect of the spirit cosmos is the spiritual order, which has been various conceptualized by different cultures at various times of history as animated by gods, ancestral spirits, demonic beings, or in more sophisticated formulations as God, universal spirit, or simply the sacred. The earthy aspect of cosmos is the environment in which we are born and live our lives. Though a few psychologists have sought to link psychological processes with the spiritual order, a systematic study of the effects of environment, nature of terrain, quality of air, sunlight, birds, animals, trees and flowers, seasons, and so on, on human development, cognition, and mental health has still to be initiated. An area of psychology that naturally evolves from and is uniquely suited to the idea of India. Let me take another hypothetical example, this time from psychotherapy. The treatment of a patient suffering from anhedonia, the condition where one finds no pleasure in any activity, however intrinsically pleasurable the activity may be. In a psychotherapy imbued with the idea of India, the therapeutic goal will not only be a restoration of sexual pleasure, but a restoration that takes place under the guiding star of loving intimacy, the form of sympathy in this context, which transforms the sex into a thing of beauty, of truth. Or if you prefer the more earthy language of the writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez, what an Indian analyst communicates to the patient will be, don't let yourself die without knowing the wonder of fucking with love. <clears throat> In Indian psychotherapy, the pleasure of eating will not be restored only for itself, but under the star of fellowship, the form of sympathy in this particular context, which turns even a simple meal into a feast, a celebration of solidarity with others who share it. Similarly, Rabindranath's vision would also raise questions about literature. Have we sufficiently explored the basic assumptions that lie behind Western theories of literary criticism and judgments of literary worth, which we use in the teaching of literature in our universities. Do they need to be balanced or at least looked at from the angle of sympathy? I have <coughs> sympathy, which I've postulated as the defining, following Rabindranath, postulated as the defining feature of Indian civilization, the idea of India. A hint of the possibilities is again provided by Rabindranath in his remarks on Shakespeare, who he greatly admired, and Kalidas, who he revered. And I quote him here, the fury of passion in two of Shakespeare's youthful poems is exhibited in conspicuous isolation. It is snatched away naked from the context of the all. It has not the green earth or the blue sky around it. It is there ready to bring to our view the raging fever which is in man's desires and not the balm of health and repose which encircles it in the universe. As I understand him, Indian literary criticism will pay as much attention to the movement of sympathy in a work of literature as following Western canon it does at the moment to the movement of desire. The characters in Hindi writer Prem Chand's fiction or for that matter, Rabindranath's, for example, may not plumb the depths of human passions, a shortcoming that from the Indian point of view is relieved and compensated by the exquisite movement of sympathy that characterizes the best of these works. The highest accolades will, of course, be reserved for literary works that combine both the movements. For me, some of Tolstoy's writings come immediately to mind. Social movements in service of justice for the weak and oppressed are rapidly picking up pace in our country, shaking traditional hierarchies and power structures. This is a welcome development. Most of these movements, however, seem to operate on the basis of only one ethic, 
justice, which is related to the issue of power, of correcting unskewed and unfair power relations. In an almost sacralized ethic of justice, what matters is the outcome, not the path. Thus, there have been eloquent voices that have defended violence in service of justice. In her Reflections on Violence, the philosopher Hannah Arendt writes, under certain circumstances, violence which is to act without argument or speech and without reckoning with consequences is the only possibility of setting the scales of justice right again. In this sense, rage and violence that sometimes not always goes with it belongs to the natural emotions and to cure a man of them would mean nothing less than to dehumanize or emasculate him. I believe that the Indian ethic of sympathy, compassion in this context, must temper the quest for justice. In our quest to right a wrong, bring the ethic of justice to the forefront, we are in danger of losing sight of what both Gandhi and Tagore held was the defining characteristic of Indian civilization. In Tagore's words, quoting him, creative force needed for the true union in human society is love. Justice is only an accompaniment to it, like the beating of Tom Tom to song. Tagore's creation of university at Shantiniketan in the 1920s then sprang from this vision of India, an Indian university in which Indian cultures would be represented in all their variety, a university that would give new life to the idea of India. He soon realized that actually his mission was much broader indeed. Indeed, it was the mission of the present age, a meeting of East and West that would bear new fru fruit for humanity. Shanti Niketan would bring forth its fullness of flower and fruit only if through Rabindranath it also sent its roots to the Western soil. At a time of struggle for freedom from Western colonial domination, a time when Gandhi's call of non-cooperation with the British was loud, Rabindranath's vision of the complementarity of civilizations, of a harmony between ideas of East and West for the creation of a universal man had few takers. He was accused by some of staying apart from the national struggle, even of toading to the British, accusations that caused him deep anguish. Writing to Andrews about his forthcoming travel to Europe at a time when Gandhi's movement of non-cooperation with the Raj had captured the country's imagination, he says, personally, I do not think my overcautious doctor was wise in holding me back. He does not fully realize how great is the mental strain that my stay in India imposes upon me. It is the moral loneliness which is a constant and invisible burden that oppresses me most. I wish it were possible for me to join hands with Mahatma Gandhi and thus at once surrender myself to the current of popular approbation. But I can no longer hide it from myself that we are radically different in our apprehension and pursuit of truth. Today to disagree with Mahatma and yet to find rest in one's surroundings in India is not possible, and therefore I am waiting for my escape next March with an impatient feeling of longing. I know I have friends in Europe who are my real kindred and whose sympathy will act as a true restorative in my present state of weariness. It was not as if Rabindranath did not admire Gandhi. In the beginning, he may have called Gandhi a moral tyrant who in context of life in his newly established ashram had the power to make his ideas on celibacy, food, and so on, prevail through strict obedience, through slavery rather than freedom. Later though, it was precisely the lived morality of Gandhi's life, his moral power, which evoked Rabindranath's respect and admiration. Where they continued to differ, however, were in their attitudes toward the West. Unlike a young Gandhi's denunciation of Western civilization in his Hind Swaraj, Rabindranath rejected only the deformations in the idea of in West that came to India all plan and purpose with the shock of passion and without any humanity. The vision of harmony of India and the West, which had been vouchsafed to him as an 18 year old in England, the discovery of the meaning of his name and the mission it imposed upon him were to stay with Robi till the end of his life. Thank you. <laughs>